the scripture this morning. We're going to start in Genesis 4, 1 through 5. So if you would like to turn there, do so now. Genesis 4. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. And then we'll move to Mark 12. Uh, verse 40, 41 through 44. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. This is the reading of God's word. I wonder if some of you are like me and that you like an old movie. Anybody that little quirky? Have you got a favorite? I noticed the other day I didn't watch it, but I think maybe I've watched it ten times. In my lifetime, Ben-Hur was on. That's just a great, great film, you know? And there are a lot of others. One of our favorites, and some of you may have seen it, is the long, long trailer. Um, it's a Desi Arnaz, Lucia Ball movie. In this story, uh, Ricky and, and uh, Lucy get married, and they buy this long trailer. It's a 60-foot long trailer. And they get married, and they go from the east to the west, and the adventure of their trailer travels is... Phenomenal. One of the things they do is get into a city where they have to back up all of the traffic in order to get them around. And of course, there weren't the freeways in those days. And another thing, Lucy, every place they stop, she gets one of these great big rocks and puts it in. And Ricky says, honey, we can't do this. You know, we've got to get rid of this. And then when they start, she doesn't do it. She says, okay, but she hides all these big rocks. And then they start to climb the mountain in Colorado. And uh, it, it's hilarious, and if you've never seen it, I don't know if you like crazy stuff like that. One of the reasons that we like that, and Doris and I many times on our anniversary have watched that movie. In 1959, Doris and I bought a New Moon house trailer. Now, it wasn't 60 feet long like that New Moon in the yellow trailer, but it was 38 feet long, and we hooked it on to our 1957 Ford, and we pulled it south to go down to Texas in Longview, Texas. I had enrolled in an engineering school. And I remember pulling into Little Rock, Arkansas with that trailer behind us. And there were no freeways that day, those days, you know. And we went into a restaurant and there was just this nice way to park. And so I, I parked lots of space. We went into the restaurant to eat and we came out and there was a car not too far ahead of where we had parked. There was a highway sign right here, and I knew that when I pulled out and pulled my trailer, pulled the car out, my trailer was gonna smack right into that sign. And I stood there, and I did not know what to do. And there was a man who came along, and he had, had too much to drink. But he said, buddy, you get in your car and you drive. Okay, he reached down and pulled that sign out of the ground, and we drove away. I could see him in our mirrors that stuck out this far. 
I hope that he crammed it back then too. <laughs> But all of this to tell you that many years ago, we went to a school called Letourneau Technical Institute, was founded by a dear man, R.G. Letourneau, who was a great inventor. R.G. Letourneau was a businessman in the early uh, 1900s, and during the great San Francisco earthquake, California earthquake, he lost everything. He lost absolutely everything. He didn't have any insurance to cover his business or anything like that. But what Letourneau did was decide to start over again. And then he said, Lord, I'm going to give you 90% of all that I make. And I'm going to live on 10%. And he didn't make a bargain with the Lord. He didn't say, if you will bless me. I think he already knew that God would bless him. Well, I got to know this man a little bit by uh, going to church with him. We affectionately called him Pop Letourneau. We would go over to his house on Sunday evenings for uh, hymn sings. But he left an impression upon me. And I, I just glory in the fact that I had the experience of knowing him and this great truth in his life that God blessed him so wonderfully. Now, I'd like to talk to you about bringing money to the Lord today. No, I'm not going to try to talk you into giving 90%, okay? And I, I know that bringing money to the Lord is a very touchy subject. And preachers probably would rather preach about anything else in the scripture or in life than about giving. And I remember my own hesitancy when I was... Uh, a pastor, but I just feel that very definitely there's something that many of us do not know. And I have to tell you that what I'm going to share with you today, I have not always practiced in my life. I was raised to know that tithing was the right thing to do. And there have been times in my life when I haven't tithed. I also need to tell you that this message doesn't originate with me. Although, as I heard Pastor Michael say when he was quoting somebody else, after it comes to me and comes out of me, it's a little different or very different from what it was in the first. But I'd like to talk about bringing to the Lord. And I'd like to bring you some very definite scriptural principles. Now, there are just way too many scriptures here. So you have this little sheet, and I won't ask you to turn to these in your Bible, but Scotty... And I thank God for him is going to put those scriptures up on the screen for us. And we will take a pretty quick look at, uh, at most of them. Now, I'm not a prosperity preacher as some TV preachers are, but I am a prosperity preacher in this sense. I believe clearly that in the scripture, there is God's plan for every one of his family, every one of his children, for financial security and, and for good wealth management. My difference with many of the prosperity preachers is that I think God's prosperity often comes in different ways than in dollars and cents. But I would like to emphasize the scriptural standard here for bringing to the Lord. The scriptural standard is the issue. So if you don't agree with something that I say, let's check it out and see what the scripture says. You've already heard two stories about financial prosperity, financial security. And the first one was where Jesus called his disciples and he said, look at that widow there. And she put in everything that she had. And the other people were giving out of their wealth and Jesus made this observation that most people give out of their wealth rather than out of their poverty. And I have an idea that that's true for many, many people. Maybe it's not out of our wealth, but we give out of our leftovers. How many people pay their bills, meet their needs, then whatever is left over, put that in the church offering? Now, I would never ask you, 
How much did you put in the offering this morning? And Lord, bless that offering, please. I would never ask you because, first of all, it's not my business. None of my business. But it is the Lord's business. The other problem with how much did you give to the Lord today is a trick question. And it's in my title. So the first question is, what did you bring to the Lord? There's a difference biblically between bringing and giving. And I'm going to start with a scripture of Malachi. And Scotty is going to put these scriptures all up there for you. We have those, and I believe that, uh, that I have the same thing that we have. Let's read this scripture. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Do you notice the word bring? What's the difference between bringing and giving? You bring something that is already God's. The tithe is already his. And we have the choice of either bringing it to him or stealing it from him. Now, those are some pretty hard words, I know. If we take this scripture, that's the choice that we have. And the tithe is the top 10%. It's the beginning. It's the first part. And this is so entwined with God's character. And here's something that I, as I developed this, wish that I had known years and years ago. You know the old saying, too old, too soon, too smart, too late. Well, that's happened to me many, many times. But I've been a late bloomer in my life, but fortunately still blooming. But this is what I discovered, that this truth of the first, the top, right off the top, that is part of God's character. Would you believe that 90% of your income with 10% tithe will go farther then 100% of your income will go, and it's not tithe. Now, where's the math in that? I don't know. I don't think there is any math in it. But let's go to Proverbs and look at 3, 5, and 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Got it? There's where the math comes in. So the rest of it says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And that's really saying that God can stretch out that 90% after you've given the 10% in ways that math cannot explain. But honor the Lord with your wealth, the first fruits of all your crops. Now in Old Testament times and biblical times and in some cultures today, the tithe is across everything. So your crops, your grain, your herbs, or whatever it is. And that would be true if we were in that kind of a culture today. But for us, most of the time, it's our income. And so that tithe is that top, right off the top, and the 10%. Notice God says in the Malachi passage, test me. Prove me. And there's a fine line between tempting God and testing God. We are not to tempt God. But God says, test me in this. Give me an opportunity to show you what I will do. And that's a step of faith. And this is true about so many things in our lives. That we don't do something to test God, but we do something in obedience to God and give him an opportunity to show how that he can make 90% seem like 
110%. But again, this is all according to the scripture. The second story that I'd like to have you look at is from Cain and Abel's offering. And Scotty's going to put up that Genesis passage there for us. And I just want you to notice that was what uh, Anna Lee read in uh, the scripture a few minutes ago. You know, at first look, this story, you, you don't quite get it. Is God right in this? It says that Cain was a farmer and Abel was a herder. And so Cain brought some of his produce and offered it to the Lord. Abel brought an animal. And God was displeased with Cain's offering, but he was pleased with Abel's. Well, why was that? Where is God coming from? Look at verse 3 with me. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Some of the fruits of the soil. It doesn't say, as it says here with Abel, in the course of time, and Abel brought portions from some of the firstborn of his flock the very first. And we wonder where they got all of this information because it hasn't been specified as far as the scripture is concerned. But you know, when you go back and read there in Genesis, God walked with people. And even with Cain after he sinned, God was walking and talking with Cain when he said, I'm gonna put a mark on you so that nobody kills you. So there were many things that they seem to have known that we don't find specified in the scripture. But God certainly must have told Cain and Abel both, and Adam and Eve, that it was the very first that he expected. It was the very first that they were to bring to him because the very first was his. That top 10%, God says, is his. There's another scripture that's a comment on this, and that's the Hebrew scriptures. And once again, I uh, hope that you will look at some of these scriptures uh, at another time. And Scotty will turn to that. So here's a comment. By faith, Abel to offer God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offering. And it is by faith that he speaks even though he is dead. So Abel's message his act is speaking to us here today. And that's really something when you consider how long he has been dead, yet he is still speaking to us through his words, through his action. So Cain brought some, Abel brought the firstborn. And then it also tells us in Hebrews 9.22 that in fact the law requires nearly everything be cleansed with blood, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And so here's the other issue. The produce was not a blood offering. Now what he could have done would be to take that and trade it to his brother for an animal to sacrifice. And here's a biblical principle from Genesis chapter three, all the way through to the end of the book, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. The only way that we can be saved, only way that we can be part of God's family is through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is true from the very beginning of time, the very beginning of God interacting with his creatures. There's also another word in that Malachi portion that says, bring to me, which is a word similar to consecrate. Now, it's not just that God wants this. It is that this comes out of God's character. First of all, he owns it all. Did you ever sing when you were a kid? He owns a cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine, 
And it goes on, there are a couple of hymns about God owning everything. And that is, is certainly true. And I'd like to turn you to the principle of the first, and we'll go to that Exodus scripture. And Scotty will get that up there for us. The Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me every firstborn male, the first offspring of every womb among the Israelites to me, whether man or animal. This is God claiming what is rightfully his. You know, we need to be impressed with God's sovereignty every once in a while. Our brothers and sisters in the Reformed tradition, they take that sovereignty of God and hold it before themselves so very, very much. And it may be that in our tradition, we need to look at God's sovereignty, his preeminence. There's nothing, there's no one, no force, no power, anything in the universe that comes first, such as our God. And over and over again, scripture proclaims it. But when he says consecrate, that is the very same word as Malachi saying, bring to me, bring or to consecrate. Now, there were many animals in the Old Testament that were unclean. Even so, the first one had to be consecrated to the Lord, but it had to be done so by redemption. So back in that time, if I had a camel born, and it was the first one from the womb of the mother camel, then I had to redeem that. And I would redeem that by taking it and trading it to someone for one of the clean animals. And all of this is back in the book of Exodus and Leviticus. Anything with a cloven hoof was, and that means split, uh, was not acceptable as an offering to God. And remember, all of this is laid out very, very clearly in the scripture. The firstborn was what would be offered, given to God as a tithe. And this comes now from God's preeminence because God is first and foremost to all, to everything. You know, we talk about the attributes of God and one of his attributes, and I believe the primary one, is his preeminence. God is preeminent. He is number one. There's just nothing or no one that is greater than he. Last week when Teresa sang the song El Shaddai, uh, and I really enjoyed that, she reminded us of our, the names of God. And the name El Elyon is God Most High, God above every. Now there were many other gods, but they were false gods. They were not true gods. But anything that a person might worship, in a sense, is a god. But there are many spirits looking for worship, looking for people's attention. But God most high. And this firstness from the tithe, from everything that we have, comes out of God's character. God has to have the first because that's in keeping with his character. Don't want to sound like I'm making a joke out of this, but God cannot play second fiddle to anyone. God cannot be second place. He is either first place in my life and yours, or else he is not. And that's because of his preeminence. That's because of his character. And that's why Malachi asks the question, will you rob God? It's his already, and it goes to his preeminence. God is the first, and God gets the first, and that's the principle of the tithe. Now that's part of what I wanted to share with you today. This next part, if you will turn in the scriptures to Colossians, we will look at a great truth here that is tied into this. So the first chapter of Colossians is a wonderful Christology. It talks all about Jesus Christ, who he was, is, 
And there's one statement that I pulled out here. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Firstborn. We don't have a great word in our English language to tell us what that word means. But the closest that I know that we can come to, he is the prototype. He is the first of a kind and there's nothing else, no one else to compare him to. Now, this is not the first to be born. There is a cult teaching that says that Jesus was the first to be born and Satan was the second to be born. No, we are Trinitarians. We believe that God, the triunity, has always existed as Father, Son, and Spirit. And we believe that because the scripture is very clear about that. But Jesus is the firstborn, this first prototype. You know, every time they build a car or an airplane, they build a prototype. And incidentally, did any of you see that flying fortress going over yesterday? Uh, I, I just, I enjoyed that. I ran out of the house two or three times to, to, to look at that. That's part of my history. I was alive when, when those were uh, winning the war for us. Well, coming back to the prototype, Jesus Christ is the firstborn. And so when God says the first of every womb is to be dedicated, consecrated to me, this was a foreshadowing way back in the Old Testament times of the Lord Jesus Christ coming and being the sacrifice. And there's something so precious here. So when an unclean animal was born, it was taken and traded for a clean animal. You and I are unclean in God's sight when we are born. And Jesus, the clean, came and gave himself for us. And now, those of us who are in Christ, we stand clean before him because he took our sin and it went to the cross with him and it died with him. And he came out of the grave, this new person, this new resurrected person, and we have that eternal standing in him. So way back there in that Old Testament time, there was this foreshadowing. And when you and I take 10% off the top, right off the top, the first, and put it to the Lord's work, we are proclaiming the clean, giving himself for the unclean. This is so entwined with God's nature. And this is what I was telling you that I wish that I had known many, many years ago instead of just a few years ago. But that speaks so clearly, so loudly, that when we tithe, we're trusting God. And that must be what that widow did. She said, this isn't going to buy me anything. I'm just going to put it in there. And it's up to God to take care of me. And all through the Old Testament, this was the practice. And they knew. And you know there are many stories about how God provided because they gave of the tithe. Now, there are people who would argue, and I've been on this side, that tithing is Old Testament and it's law. And it's not New Testament and it's grace. I don't argue that anymore because the scripture is very clear. Never in the New Testament was tithing abrogated. Never was it said, no, you don't have to do this anymore. As a matter of fact, Jesus affirmed, and we'll look at Matthew 23 here, this very point. Matthew 23, 23. So this is Jesus speaking. Woe to you teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites. You have given a tenth of your spices, your mint, your dill, your cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. But notice the next sentence. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Jesus did not say, we don't tithe anymore. And again, when you see that that's a picture of him 
picture of his being the firstborn, the clean for the unclean, you can see how very, very important this is. So it's not just a matter of law, but it's a matter of within the framework of the scripture. And we have another scripture that we'll look at, and that's the uh, Second Corinthians scripture. And this is one that we often refer to when we're talking about New Testament giving. So remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. So each person should give what he or she has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And you know, there's some joy in tithing. And that's what I discovered. There's a joy in tithing. Now it says, decide in your own heart. That's still within the framework of the scripture. The truth of the matter is, I have not begun to give to God until I reach 11%. And incidentally, this is not just money. This is time. This is talents too. We need to tithe our talents and our time. I'm talking mainly about money here. But still within the framework, we are to give freely out of our heart and to finish that. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And what that really is saying is that you'll be able to support other good things. You'll be able to give to others. And that's why God wants to bless us. And you go back to the Abrahamic covenant and not a scripture that I have here. But God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and I will make you a blessing to all the families of the earth. God wanted to bless Abraham so that he could be a blessing. And I think he no less wants to bless you and me so that we can be a blessing to others. And again, I know you found when you have given something to something in particular, there's a joy, there's a liberation, there's a freedom in knowing that God has committed himself to me, to you, once you take that top 10% off. And just sort of finish up with one verse here. You know, some of you may be saying, I've heard this before, and, and I'm glad that you have. And some of you may be saying, I've never heard this before. Well, I'm glad that you're here and you're hearing it. And once again, I submit this to you as a very scriptural principle, very scriptural teaching. And when Jesus came, and this Mark uh, scripture tells us this, that he said, the kingdom of God is near, so repent and believe the good news. That word repent all by itself simply means when you're going in this direction, turn around and go in the other direction. Turn around. So it may be that some of us need to turn around on this. It may be that you haven't been taking the top 10% right off. And it may be that you haven't been giving beyond that 10%. If that's true, and you're a part of the family of God, I would say you need to repent. You need to just turn around and go in the other direction. And I'll finish with this story. I don't know how many years ago, well, sometime in the 80s, over in the old building, we had a missionary speaker and <clears throat> we were attending over there at the time. And this missionary speaker told about a need and a financial need. And we were primarily a single income uh, family and uh, we tied at the time, but we didn't give a lot of money. And I remember the Lord laying an amount of money on my heart that this missionary said we need. And I didn't have the money. It wasn't a whopping amount, I don't remember, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a fortune, but it was more money than I had to give. And for some reason, I just, I said, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And that had been pretty uncharacteristic for me to just hear the Lord say, meet that need. And it didn't have to be met that night, but uh, it could have, I think, 30 days before it had to be met. 
So I told the missionary afterwards, uh, I know who's going to take care of that. And I told Doris, and she said something like, how are you going to do that? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. Monday when I went to work, I was a teacher at Kalamazoo Central. Uh, the principal called me in, and with some other people, I was the uh, department chairman, and he called all the department chair people in. And we had been doing some extra work uh, that we all thought was above and beyond our, our pay grade. And the principal realized that, and he had put in for us a, an extra amount of money. And wouldn't you know, and I don't remember how much it was, but what I had committed was 10% of that money. And woo, <laughs> you know, and it's occurred to me more than once. If I hadn't committed that 10%, I wonder if maybe I wouldn't have gotten, I don't know. But anyway, and I just know that when the Lord speaks to you, there is going to be a way that he will show you. And I don't always say you can make that promise on a Sunday night and it'll be revealed how it's going to work out on Monday afternoon. It may be a year, five years, ten years. It may be when we sit at the Lord's feet. I don't know. But I want to tell you there's a joy in tithing. There's a joy in understanding who God is. So when we bring that tithe, we say, God, you're number one in, in, in all of my life, in everything. And that's what makes God smile because he can't be number two. Pray with me. Lord, take these words from your word. Bring them to our mind, to our hearts, to our spirits. And may we find the blessing of being faithful to you and your being faithful to us. May we find the blessing of obedience. And we pray in your matchless name, O oh, Lord Jesus, the firstborn of all creation, to the glory of the Father, in the name and the power of the Spirit. Amen.